I'll start with, I guess, a little uh, little story tidbit. I was talking to one of the guys on my team, Brandon here, and talking to Ben from Armory. And I was saying that there's a lot of momentum in the community around Spinnaker. There's just like all these companies are talking about Spinnaker. The Slack channel is growing. Uh, and Ben shared with me this. This is a Spinnaker 1.0 release, uh, Spinnaker Slack team. You can see there's, a, there's an uptick in membership there. Uh, this is the GitHub stars, right? So there's a clear, clear momentum, right? And uh, this must be the year of Spinnaker. Let's uh, start with our first talk, which is uh, around Spinnaker 1.0 and the road to 2.0. Andy from Netflix and Kristen from Google are going to do this talk. So let's give them a warm welcome. So Spinnaker looks cool, but uh, it was open sourced in November 2015. And it was a really interesting product. It was open sourced, um, you know, I call it the Benjamin Button problem. It was sort of fully mature, but it skipped adolescence. You know, it was used in production by Netflix for sort of one of the biggest properties on the web. We kind of skip some, some things that other people may care about, like authorization, onboarding, setup, um, some sort of basic things. So I think a lot of people, customers that we talked to or potential users looked at and said, you know, this is really cool, um, but it's sort of missing some basic functionality. Our org doesn't really necessarily look like Netflix org, so we're not sure how this is going to work for us. Um, and we did a proof of concept, but, you know, it's not, it's not quite there yet. So our goal with this was really to make it enterprise ready for, for sort of everybody else. So if you, anyone recognizes the image up there, uh, that's from Arrival, one of my favorite movies of the last couple of years. As I got to know Spinnaker, it kind of reminded me of that, right? It was sort of something cool was happening. There was sort of some pattern, but it was kind of hard to figure out exactly what it is, how do I use it. And so we really wanted to make it more approachable for people. The first thing you do if you haven't gone yet, uh, there's a brand new Spinnaker.io site. So we basically redid the docs from scratch as part of this launch. Um, so a lot of the screenshots that we're going to be talking about are from there. We have a very cool new design, courtesy of uh, some designers at Netflix, Jeremy. And uh, everything there is, uh, is really oriented to people who are setting up, guide, reference, things like that. So if we're going to be a multi-cloud platform, we should probably support multiple clouds. Um, when we launched initially, uh, it had support for Amazon ECS and Google Compute Engine, GCE. Uh, so then over the last sort of year and a half or so, we added a bunch more. Microsoft came on with Azure. Kubernetes was a big one. Obviously, Kubernetes could run on a lot of different platforms on-prem, uh, in the cloud. OpenStack and App Engine, which is another interesting one that's sort of um, more of a platform as a service. It doesn't really kind of look like the others, uh, but is a sort of interesting use case around sort of pipeline orchestration. Uh, so looking ahead a little bit, DCOS is currently in flight uh, by Cerner, and Oracle Bare Metal is sort of on deck as well. So we're really building out um, a pretty good representation of kind of the major cloud providers. So um, semantic versioning. So Prior to version 1.0, um, each microservice had to be individually managed and set up. So if people have gone through this already before, you know how painful this was. Um, basically, every piece was independent. So you know we had deployment manager charts, Helm charts for it. But even once you got it set up, each microservice was incremented sort of independently, and you were kind of on your own for, for managing those microservices and for managing any dependencies or breaking changes or things like that. So with 1.0 now, each bundle of microservices is a unique snapshot and version. So from 1.00 to 1.01, we basically did a new patch version of CloudDriver that bumped up the Spinnaker version. And so now going forward, you, know, you don't really have to concern yourself too much with the different microservices and what version they're at. Um, it's really just sort of Spinnaker itself is versioned. So we think that makes it a lot, more e a lot easier to sort of stay with it as new updates come. Speaking of setting up, uh, the other new tool is Halyard. So Halyard is a CLI tool to, uh, which basically sets up, manages, and configures your Spinnaker instance. So it runs alongside or um, sort of external and is used uh, basically to, to do uh, managing. So say you have a Spinnaker instance running. These are actual Halyard commands. You can list the available versions, uh, configure your version. It's a declarative model, so it's config-based. So basically, you update your config file. Hal deploy apply, and then Halyard handles rolling out uh, your updated microservice. So I don't know if anyone has tried to set up Spinnaker uh, in this room beforehand. I don't know how long it took you, uh, whether it was hours or maybe days. Um, but now with Halyard, you can kind of do it in a couple minutes. And then even as you go forward and add providers for different multiple clouds and things like that, um, again, Halyard is your friend here. So we picked App Engine because so it's a relatively simple example. So you just do Hal config provider app engine. Set your environment variables, and uh, and off you go. 
the last big thing we added was role-based access control. So, um, you know, Netflix is a pretty open organization, so is Google, where before if you logged into Spinnaker, you could basically see everything that was happening on that Spinnaker instance, all the applications, um, which, you know, for a lot of organizations doesn't work. Um, some have regulations, some just sort of corporate culture don't really work that way. So uh, with Fiat, which is the microservice which controls all this, um, we added authentication and authorization. So OAuth is recommended for authentication. Um, you can sort of see how you would set it up there with Halyard. And then authorization leverages Google Groups, GitHub Teams, LDAP, SAML, et cetera. And so that lets you gate access um, you know, through those groups uh, on an account or application basis. And you can do really cool things like you can set permissions about who can, um, who can do the approvals during the manual judgment stage on rollout so that only certain people can, can allow deployments to production. So those are some of the big new things coming with 1.0. We got new docs, role-based access control, um, more cloud providers, and uh, Halyard CLI and semantic versioning. Um, so before I hand it off, I just want to talk a little bit about um, open cloud and what we mean by that. I think this is a, this is a real passion of mine if I think about um, sort of the software world uh, and where it's going and, and what, what, you know, what I like about it. I think open source projects tend to be some of the really most exciting ones out there. Um, and it's really cool. I mean, how often do you work on a project that, you know, Netflix, one of Amazon's biggest customers, and Google and Microsoft are all really big um, contributors to. Um, I think it's really interesting that, that they can kind of come together, and whether it's, um, you know, Visual Studio Code from Microsoft or Kubernetes or, you know, Yarn or React. Um, I think there's some really cool stuff happening with open cloud. So this is from Mary Meeker's uh, recent Internet Trends uh, survey. Um, so these are the top three concerns that IT managers have about moving to the cloud. And I have a big arrow there pointing to the one that I think is interesting. Um, if you look at concern about lock-in and the ability to change vendors, that's more than tripled uh, since 2012 to 2015. Um, if you look at the others, they've either gone down or incremented by single amounts. Um, but lock-in is really becoming a concern for people. I think it's kind of funny, too, if you look at uh, sort of uncertainty of costs has really kind of gone down. I think people went from uncertain to actually worried about it. And if you put your sort of uh, CTO hat on, you know, multi-cloud, it gives you rollover availability, uh, it gives you more security. And then, you know, for a CEO, um, you know, I think a lot of CEOs were drawn to the cloud. They got to, you know, basically switch high capital cost expenses to sort of metered ongoing variable costs. Um, but then they kind of realized that, wow, this is actually a really critical path that I have for my company that's, that's sort of locked into an external provider that may change rates, they may compete with us, who knows. So what are people doing about it? 85% uh, of enterprise companies larger than 1,000 people have a multi-cloud strategy. Um, it's a little deceiving because they kind of bucket hybrid cloud in there as well, um, sort of what that means exactly in terms of multiple public clouds. But regardless, I think you know, everybody's looking at multi-cloud. A lot of the customers that we talk to, even if they're not implementing multi-cloud, just the fact that they know it's an option should they need to migrate without having to do a full rewrite of all their developer tooling is really appealing. So last slide here with um, the charts, uh, another one from RightScale. Uh, so cloud initiatives, um, you can see implementing CI CD in the cloud, 38%. Uh, That's pretty high, obviously. I don't know what the other people are doing. Um, they probably already did it, I assume. But you can see it's on par with uh, the expanded use of containers, which I think is sort of a known entity in the market of, of a, something that's happening. So in the context of all this, what, how do we think about Spinnaker and Spinnaker as a platform? Um, so typically, you know, this really comes into play mostly with providers. This is where we've seen the most community contributions, and we've seen it's the most extensible part, I would say, of the core framework. Um, so we talked about sort of the providers there. But if you look at the larger Spinnaker platform, um, there's a lot more going on. So we have first-class notification integration with Slack and HipChat, uh, persistent storage with sort of the big three plus Redis, build and bake, uh, Packer, kind of lonely there from HashiCorp, stages, uh, Jenkins and Docker, triggers, Gitbase, Docker, Travis CI, and Jenkins, and uh, security we talked about a little bit. And we're also adding monitoring. Uh, and so that's Datadog, Prometheus, and Stackdriver for uh, the logo people in the room. So you know, if you look at the whole ecosystem, I think Andy's going to talk about this a little bit in some of the stuff we're working on for 2.0. Um, you know, 1.0 is about getting the core product to enterprise and enterprise ready. And I think as we look ahead, um, in addition to the cool features, I think growing the community, making it more extensible, not having to sort of go through the core team with PRs to sort of add on and, and optimize it for your team are going to be some, uh, some core themes that we really want to focus on. So that was a nice transition to looking ahead to 2.0, and I'll hand it off to Andy. Thank you, Christopher. 
And I just want to underscore the, the work that Google did to uh, make Spinnaker 1.0 with um, setup and authorization. Awesome stuff. Uh, specifically, all the AuthZ, AuthN stuff, Netflix is going to start leveraging in the near future here, so that's exciting. We already set up Spinnaker um, many years ago, and we haven't needed to set it up since, so it was, I'm glad that you all, uh, I, I think the community is happy that you all tackled that problem. It was something, obviously, Netflix wasn't necessarily going to uh, ever address. You could say maybe it took us a couple of years to set up Spinnaker. <laughs> so uh, when we look ahead to uh, what's coming down the pipe, um, one of the cool features of Spinnaker at Netflix that, um, and this is particularly heavy, heavily used, is our automated canary analysis platform. And it's first class integration with Spinnaker. It was actually kind of a watershed moment for uh, the delivery engineering team, you know, my team, the team that built Spinnaker. When we added uh, ACA to Spinnaker, you know, the dominoes all fell down and all the tier one teams basically jumped onto Spinnaker as a platform because they got this for free. And so this is the idea of being able to say, hey, look, uh, before I roll this service out to 100% you know, live traffic, I want to have a small amount of traffic hit it, and I want to do kind of an apples to apples comparison with this version versus the old version. Uh, it's, like I said, uh, it's paramount to uh, delivery at Netflix. It's very heavily used. And unfortunately, for the rest of the world, uh, it's not available to you all. Um, however, that's changing. Uh, the, the ACA team at Netflix has partnered again with the good folks at Google, and they are working on open sourcing uh, the ACA platform, uh, first class integrated with, uh, with Spinnaker, and it'll uh, encompass multiple data sources, uh, not just uh, Atlas, which is Netflix's telemetry platform, but it'll support data. Stack Driver, OpsMX, Datadog, and Prometheus. And it's going to be coming out like within a quarter or so. So this is really exciting. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the ACA team at Netflix is actually currently battle hardening this here at Netflix. So when it when it is open sourced, it'll have the, uh, you know, the the battle hardened kind of use cases already at least solved from a Netflix and Google standpoint. One of the biggest features, aside from ACA, that the community asks for is this whole idea of infrastructure as code. How can I you know, define this stuff outside of Spinnaker? And so what that effort is uh, what we're kind of effectually calling declarative delivery. And the first part of declarative delivery was this idea of managed pipeline templates. And managed pipeline templates are already out there. Uh, we're onboarding teams at Netflix already. So we are, uh, there's a number of efforts, and again, in partnership with the community to uh, build in some, uh, some UI features, but also peg out some of the, uh, the things we're learning with managed pipeline templates. Uh, this effort, again, is leading to a, a larger effort called declarative delivery. And ultimately, the end story there is that you'll have a file, or an app will have a file that will ultimately describe some traits, some expectations, and some policies. And Spinnaker will infer, ultimately, the, the how to do all this you know, in terms of delivery. Because uh, if you think about it right now with Spinnaker, it's very much imperative. You go in there and you say, you know, I want to do this, 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 and this. And what we've obviously seen in Netflix is that there are certain patterns that have come out of that. Um, a lot of teams are pretty much doing the same patterns. And so if we can pull back a little and say, hey, look, if you're an application, just give us some traits, like what tier are you, what's your SLA, uh, who owns it, and maybe some other things. Give us some KPIs. And then maybe you have some policies with respect to how this thing will be delivered into production. And we can infer a whole lot of um, aspects about that, and then we can determine the how. Uh, and ultimately, that will provide the, you know, the, the benefit of velocity for service teams using Spinnaker, uh, but also will give us a whole lot of opportunities to have um, you know, uh, efficiencies to be gained in terms of being able to figure out how to right size them on instance types, or, or we can auto deploy them onto Docker. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's a whole lot of interesting things we can do there. So this effort is well underway. If you are in the Spinnaker ecosystem, I suspect that you are probably aware of the managed pipeline templates effort. But uh, there is a uh, spec out there, and there are a number of individuals in the community that are running with this effort. So I look forward to a lot of cool things happening here. Next, and Matt will get to more details in terms of how you can participate in the ecosystem. But one thing we want to be sure is that this is a platform that's easy to plug into. I said that you know the, the, the good work that you know, AuthN and AuthZ, the work that Google's doing, one of the cool things about the community is the innovations coming out of the community. And you know, for example, Netflix being able to take advantage of those innovations. 
And so we see, again, from a community, but even just a selfish standpoint for that Netflix, that the more extensible this platform is, the more innovations we all get to take advantage of. And so we are very much uh, focused on figuring out how we can make this a very, very pluggable system so that anyone can sit down, write a stage, write a whole you, you know, UI component. Uh, and this quarter at Netflix, we're doing a lot of this work uh, internally to ensure that service teams can build their own internal tooling, even if it isn't open sourceable. The work that we're doing to make it pluggable for them, in coordination with Google and other people in the community, will make it easy so that anyone can sit down and write a stage or even a whole new UI that you know, encompasses something with respect to actually something I'll talk about next. And that is the idea that when we, when we kicked off Spinnaker, we were very much focused on AWS deployments. And what we've seen over the evolution since you know, people have started to use Spinnaker at Netflix, and indeed more and more teams are jumping on, is that it's not just AWS deployments that we're handling. We're handling software delivery for uh, CDNs. So the Netflix app itself, when you fire it up on your, you know, your, your, your smart TV or on your browser, is ultimately downloaded from a, a CDN. And those teams are using Spinnaker to deliver that JavaScript application to a CDN. Uh, we also have library teams, teams that are producing binaries that other teams consume to you know, make their service work better. And they're using Spinnaker, uh, specifically the pipeline, that's the killer feature of Spinnaker, right? The orchestration of delivery. They're using Spinnaker to do that delivery. And so we are very much committed to making Spinnaker kind of this ubiquitous delivery platform, whether it be services that run in AWS or the cloud, it could be containers, it could be JavaScript applications, it could be libraries, it could be whatever. But ultimately, if, if there is a software asset that needs to be delivered to some environment, we want you to be able to take advantage of Spinnaker and use it as such. And those different kind of domains, whether it be like mobile, or a JavaScript application, or a library, they have a different need from a UI standpoint, because ultimately, Spinnaker, while it is a continuous delivery platform, it's also infrastructure management. And if I'm a library developer, developer um, I don't necessarily really care about, let's say, clusters and ASGs and nodes or, or instances. I really care about the visibility of that library. Who's got it? Where is it? Um, and so we're building those screens, that functionality into Spinnaker, again, making it very pluggable so that you can do the same thing in, the, in, in, your, in your company. And then finally, if, if you aren't aware, containers are eating the world. Uh, the Kubernetes work that the, the good folks at Google and, and, and the communities actually participate a lot and submitted uh, plenty of PRs. Um, there's a ton of work going into Kubernetes. There's some new stuff I suspect maybe we'll touch on tonight. Um, Netflix has its own internal container cloud called Titus, so we're also investing heavily in containers. Uh, both Titus uh, and Titus will eventually be open sourced. Um, and so there's some portion of this community that may enjoy Titus over Kubernetes perhaps. But ultimately, those innovations are going into Spinnaker. And we're making it very, very easy for container developers to deliver those containers to whether it be Kubernetes or Titus, and actually having good conversations with the community about ECS and other, uh, are there other? Oh yeah, DCOS, exactly. What was it? Mesos, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, again, a lot of effort going on here, and we uh, certainly committed from a delivery platform to make it a just compelling, awesome experience that it already is and will continue to get better. And with that, thank you. <laughs>
tons of Slack activity, a couple of thousand members in general, a bunch in dev, and somehow 106 for Halyard, and we think at least half of those are bots that Lars created. <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, lots of companies and individuals contributing uh, more every day. Uh, Andy and, and Christopher touched on a bunch of this, but, but lots of folks doing um, large-scale integrations with providers, small fixes, features, patches, everything you can imagine. So, pretty active. So, in terms of finding something to contribute, right? Um, we use Spinnaker Spinnaker for the issues tracker. There's a ton of stuff in there. Um, some of it is like nonsensical, some of it is like concrete bugs, some of it is feature requests. Uh, we often, probably not as often as we should, but we go through there and try to triage things, pick out things we can sort of immediately address, things that are longer term efforts, and oftentimes a lot of things that we think should be better handled in the Slack chat rooms, and we'll, we'll tell people that and kind of direct them there. Um, Somebody looking to get involved, that's a good place to start. Poke through those issues. You know, see if there's something that, that, that you're interested in there. Um, same thing, like all we typically do those issues, if we don't know the answer out of the gate, which typically we don't, is try to reproduce whatever it is they're reporting, do a little bit of sort of thinking on it, and then try to engage with whoever reported that issue. So anybody can do that. Um, it's a good way to identify like an area of work where you can make some kind of meaningful uh, contribution. There's a beginner-friendly flag? I was actually gonna say we should have a beginner-friendly flag. We have a beginner-friendly flag, <laughs> apparently, which I didn't know existed. Um, what did you put that on? A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Um, quite a few of the items there are, are like, you know, they're containable problems. I mean, you read through it, it's, it's not that hard to figure out what people are getting into. Um, but you have to dive into it. And the, the place where the people ask most questions is, is in the general channel. There are other channels, people ask questions all over the place, but general is the place where you find the most like end user questions. And the community is really active. We see lots of people um, pitching in and helping each other out, and that's a good way to get involved, is grab a question and, and try to help out. Um, docs, with the, the 1.0 refresh, um, we redid all the docs, we redid the landing page and the whole website, and it's much better, but there's always room for improvement with the docs. So see something missing, see something wrong, jump in. These are all like meaningful contributions and a, like really a great way to come up to speed on the project. And Code Labs, we have a bunch. They're pretty useful. Um, we all typically run through them every now and then from scratch. Um, we can always use more. If you've solved some interesting problem with Spinnaker and you see people kind of asking about it, write up how you did it, make it a Code Lab, we'll add it to the site. You'll be famous. You won't make any money off of it, but, but we'll throw it up there. Um, and we have a roadmap on that site. So uh, Andy touched on a lot of the things on the roadmap, but like get involved with those things. If you have opinions, which I think most of us do, um, share them. There's plenty of room to, uh, to sort of get more folks involved with those things. Tomas, I th think you have a question. <laughs> Tomas is saying there's a blog on the site, blog.spinnaker.io. Write an article, um, we'll, we'll absolutely add it to the blog, uh, more the merrier. There's quite a bit of material there already. So, if you want to make a code contribution. Um, you know, they fall into two categories. Something trivial, just submit a PR, use Git blame, figure out who to address it to. Um, the, there are a bunch of microservices. We all have way too much email. Um, you're, you're really better off identifying somebody to direct the PR to. Um, do that with blame, or you've seen them in the chat room talking about things that are related. If it's a non-trivial change, uh, the best bet is to like strike up a conversation with the folks most likely to be interested in that area. Um, just discuss it first, come up with some proposal, some things require a design doc, some don't, but non-trivial changes really, you should sort of prime the pump, have a conversation up front, know who's gonna be interested, get them on board, sell it a little bit, and then start to work on it. Um, once you get a little bit of kind of a meeting of the minds, create an issue on Spinnaker Spinnaker, and then start to push code, which we'll get into in a second. Um, make the PRs as small as possible. Tag that same issue on each PR so you build up a record of all these changes. Uh, it's, it's fine if things don't turn out exactly the way you wanted. It's quite easy to change things. It's not like you push that PR and it's there for the rest of time. So better off have small changes that all build up to something rather than one giant monster of a change, okay? And rebase often. The, the code is changing. Um, thousands of changes a year. So if you just you know, fork the repo at some point and go off and develop, once you make a bunch of changes and then later on you try to rebase, you're gonna be merging things all day long. So rebase often. Okay, um, our coding style is, is inconsistent, but we're consistently 
and consistent. So try to fit in with the neighbors. Um, have a look around. I hope you don't find tabs, but beyond that, try to fit in with the neighbors. Okay, most, you'll see most projects have a, most modules have a pretty consistent style, but from module to module, they sometimes change a bit. I think Tomas uses too many spaces or something, but mostly try to fit in with the neighbors. For the commits, we have all this logic that we wrote as part of this, this the mechanisms around the, the release process now, and we scrape these messages and do like automated change log generation. So follow the conventions for the commit messages and we're more likely not to push breaking changes and describe them as patches and those kinds of things. So follow those conventions. A couple of examples, write tests. They should be meaningful tests, but, but definitely write tests. Um, the second to last one there about verifying the branch starts up. Um, surprisingly often, we do it to ourselves all the time. We push a change, works fine for me. Someone else pulls it, doesn't work. Sometimes uh, Travis, not that Travis, but Metal Travis chokes on it. But often it's the person reviewing it, pulls it down, it doesn't start, it's kind of like the first thing. So, I mean, I'm now in the habit of like provision a VM with nothing else on it, check out the branch, just make sure it starts up. It'll save a bunch of time. Um, and, you know, again, assuming it's a non-trivial change, you've probably been in conversation with somebody about this change and just tag them on that PR. Um, unlikely to come across it like by happenstance if you don't point it out to them. So are you gonna get some comments, hopefully? on the, the pull request, just push additional commits. There's been a bit of back and forth discussion on this. Um, everybody has a preference. I mostly prefer like just add additional commits so you can see that the changes were in response to some comments. And then once you're all the way through the whole thing and it's approved and you're ready to merge it, you can squash it, rebase it head, and then force push the whole thing back up. Um, don't merge master. If you do, somebody will just ask you not to. We do it all the time. Um, the middle one, for whatever reason, GitHub doesn't notify that you push another commit. So typically, what will happen is you push that commit and you know, it addresses all the comments and then a week later, nothing happened. And then you say, hey, I pushed this thing and then I go back and say, you need a rebase. And then you rebase it, but you still don't tell them. And then you just keep doing that. <laughs> so Travis, not Metal Travis, Meet Travis pointed out today <laughs> that you can actually subscribe to a PR and then it will notify you of commits. And he showed me an actual email from GitHub that said somebody pushed a commit, which I've never seen before. So, so you can do that too, but, but I recommend just telling the person that you made the change. All right, so trying not to be snarky, but this is my, my snarky slide. So if what you like is getting like a never-ending deluge of emails that start with sorry for the delay, the way to accomplish that is to submit huge pull requests, like thousands of lines. Okay, because you will get a lot of emails that start with sorry for the delay. If you don't like getting that, then make the smallest PRs you possibly can. They don't actually have to move the ball forward much. But like if you're adding a new provider, you can add the stuff that gets the credentials in place first, even if there are no operations. Then add one operation at a time. Small PRs. Because what happens is people open the email, they click on the, the, the link to the pull request, and they see like 3,400 lines of code, and then they just close the email and then they hope somebody else comes across it, <laughs> and then you work on the poker face, like, ah, I didn't see it. I... <laughs> so, smaller's better. Um, I bet if you measured it, that's a pretty accurate statement, the first one, like, it's just gonna take a while. Um, smaller's better, I mean, that's, that's all I can say. Make them as small as possible, okay? So, uh, in the same vein, right? Um, once somebody's actually at the point of reviewing a pull request, why this pull request exists should be obvious and pretty much self-contained within that pull request or it should link out to something that makes this obvious. Um, other people are, are reading all of these things and are just going to inject themselves if they can't figure out why this pull request exists. Um, if there are implications, they should be made explicit, shouldn't have to guess at it. Um, and given that at some point somebody's gonna hit the, the launch button, um, you want to make them comfortable with that. So do whatever you can to make them comfortable with the fact that this is a low risk merge. Um, that's where to find us. Um, not, uh, let's see, so I, the last disclaimer, I recognize that it's a bunch of big companies involved, but it's a pretty friendly group of people. Everybody's like pretty much first name basis and kind of chatty and jokey. It's really a good bunch of people and it's not hard to get involved. There's tons of stuff to do. More ideas than we have people 
to work on these things. So really do get involved. It's, uh, despite my inability to figure out how to use this thing, it's not uh, an intimidating bunch. Um, it's a pretty fun group of people, actually. So any questions? Any of this sound like crazy talk or not make sense? No? All right, cool, thanks. Um, all right, so I'm gonna uh, go over best practices with configuration uh, management uh, tools, things like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and we see a lot of folks using them uh, with Spinnaker. And I'm gonna start with this email I literally received about 45, 50 minutes ago, and I thought I'd add it. Uh, and in yellow it says, we've been fighting fires for the past couple days because a Chef server went down, and now all the servers it configures are jammed up. LOL, unreal. And <clears throat> what I thought the email was, like what made this email amazing was it was sandwiched between, hey, did you go drinking? Here's my problem, and when you come back, we need to drink again. <laughs> and so uh, the, what I took away from this is that configuration management servers will cause you to drink. So with Spinnaker, I suggest if you're using a configuration management server, don't. But you probably won't listen to me because you guys have invested a lot of time and energy and infrastructure already into these tools, and you want to make that work with Spinnaker. And so it does work well with these tools. Uh, you just have to do it in the right way. So let's go over what those right ways are. Um, so Spinnaker works out of the box with a few system uh, packaging tools already, like Debian and RPM. Um, and in order to make it work really well, you have to take Chef and Puppet and Ansible and whatever configuration management tools you're using and treat it in the same way. And what that means is creating deployable artifacts with Chef and Puppet and Ansible. So this means taking your, uh, your recipes or your playbooks and, put, and, and creating a version of them at build time. And this is a, as a build artifact out of Jenkins. Uh, and this is really critical for you to have things like uh, uh, version management throughout the Spinnaker uh, deployment lifecycle. Um, I don't know what that clip art thing, but I had to add one, so I picked that one. So I don't know what it really means. But the next thing is to remove centralized configuration servers. So back to that first slide where the guy was saying his centralized servers were crashing and causing him uh, a lot of pain. You want to get out of that. And all of these tools, all of the configuration management tools, can run in a standalone mode. And if you do the first part, which is creating a deployable artifact, those two things mean that you actually don't need to depend on some other centralized server that you then have to manage, deal with permissions, networking, all of the other things that can fail during build time that will fail and will cause you to drink. Another thing is, once you get out of using configuration management, the first question that comes up is, what I do with things like my data bags or the secrets and all the configuration management that I had uh, in that system before? Well, the thing to do with them is to move them to the proper tool. So things like secrets, there's a ton of solutions out there. You can craft your own. Uh, whatever you do, just get it out of, of the configuration management systems. Um, so then comes time to create Packer templates. Um, and here the best thing to do is to try to keep and minimize the number of Packer templates that you have to, as, if possible, one, uh, but try to reduce, reuse, and recycle templates. I see this a lot, where people will create a new Packer template per application. Uh, and if you're doing this, it is a headache for the administrators of the Spinnaker instance. And so ideally what you want to do is extract out all of the common variables uh, and bubble that up to the bake stage to use extended attributes. And I'm going to point this out because a lot of people don't see this. So when this isn't checked, you don't see any of this. And so it looks like you can't really extend the bake stage to do whatever you want to do. But uh, this is really kind of uh, 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 the best way of doing it. Extend that out so that your application developers can pass in um, you know, your, your package name. In this case, if you're using Chef, it would be your recipe or your Ansible playbook, and allow them to uh, extend and, and uh, customize the rest of the bake stage below, but do not create multiple uh, templates for each individual application, because you'll be in admin hell. So. Um, but also, at the same time, don't let this happen, where the variables start to get way out of control. And, uh, and what we see as well is, now we have dependency management in Spinnaker uh, being exposed. You see the Tomcat version, Nginx version. And then also in the configuration and management uh, system, 
Uh, and I'm not sure why people decide to do this. I'm just telling you not to do it. So the best thing is to keep your dependencies contained inside of the dependency management tool that you chose to use, like Chef and Ansible. Don't let that really leak out into your Spinnaker pipelines or your bake stages. Make sure they're absolutely contained uh, and your life will be better for it. Um, but if you do need to have uh, variables or there's a lot of common variables between groups of applications or sets of applications, uh, make use of the, the, the var file name for, for Packer. It encapsulates all of these variables. So for instance, if you have a particular region that you want to bake in and the subnets and the VPCs are all the same for, for that particular region, encapsulate that into a variable file and let your application developers know to use that if they're going to bake in that particular region. And this simplifies it for them so that every single pipeline doesn't have the same repetitive variables like VPCs and subnet IDs. Um, and so this is another field that I see rarely get used, but it does help your application developers and kind of hide that complexity uh, from them so that they can just you know, give them the, the, the recipe name and, and go on with their day. Um, and then one of the last things uh, we'll go over is chaining pipelines to reduce uh, the entire bake uh, time. So in, when you went from the configuration management at runtime, you configured the whole machine. You started out with uh, you know, a base image, and then you did your chef or your puppet or your Ansible scripts, and it would configure the entire machine at that one time. In some cases, that could run for 30 minutes, in some cases 40 or, or even up to an hour. When you transfer that into Spinnaker, because of the, or the workflow engine that Spinnaker provides, you're able to break these things down into just uh, consumable chunks and reusable chunks. And because Spinnaker caches uh, the bakes, you're able to reuse them for, for future bakes. So um, if you're doing the security bake and tools bake and application bake all at one time, and if I'm the application developer, it costs me, that's 30 minutes every single time I want to make an application change, even though the only thing that's actually changing is that last five minutes. So breaking them up and chaining them together, uh, again, provides a really good experience for the person using Spinnaker uh, so that they're just iterating and they're just baking five minutes at a time instead of 30 minutes at a time. And that cycle time is, is really important for an application developer. And then the last thing is don't use configuration management systems. But if you have to, follow all those uh, rules and Again, it'll be, you'll be better for it. That's it. So now that we had Spinnaker and all the services running in production, we went through beta, going towards the GA, but we really didn't have a way to measure the SLAs for all these services. For this, we actually, at Lookout, we created a service uh, application called Slayer. Basically, all it does is, this is a simple Slayer deployment. It's an application which has a data dog checks for all the other applications like Jenkins, artifactories, servers, Spinnaker itself. So basically, it does all the user actions, and we are extending it as we are going up post GA. So basically, now you deploy it, and it does all these uh, coverages. So logs into GitHub, clones and push, pushes the code to the repo. Same with Artifactory. Sees if all the Jenkins masters are up and running, and you can you actually trigger a job. Log into servers, validate if an existing secret can be downloaded and can be used. Last but least, log into to Spinnaker GUI, trigger a pipeline. End up on all these matrices, they run on every 30 seconds, and they end up in Datadog like this. So now if I have to, some, we have to show a SLA to other teams, we can just go here and say like, hey, GitHub's SLA for last week was 97.88, and Git for last month was 98.50. Um, <laughs> didn't want to bring your Prometheus. I didn't know you were going to bring it, but it's our Prometheus. <laughs> We were kind of getting confused. So for, with all these moving pieces in our service delivery pipeline, we needed a way to actually validate that every piece is working all the time before actually the user gets to it and comes back to us, hey, your something is broken. We don't know what, but something doesn't work in the middle of the night. So this is, for this, we created a simple Prometheus application. It's a simple Flask application, nothing fancy about it. So the idea of this was like with multiple VPC, Amazon accounts, servers, multiple masters, how should we test it? So basically, it starts with baking the application. It forces rebakes each time, so even if it doesn't change anything, it basically simulates like, oh, OK, I have a change. Somebody pushed it to GitHub. I, can I bake it in multiple regions? After ba baking, right now, we just use two regions. 
So it deploys to those two regions and then tries to see, hey, now I'm deployed, what if I have to run some tests from Jenkins? Is the Jenkins connectivity working? So that is the third stage here. It is trying to attach itself as the Jenkins layer. So at this place, it becomes a little tricky. Like I have to check now, hey, can I make new Debian packages? So after attaching, it actually builds itself without any change and gives itself a new version for the next iteration. So these, and it tries to build, it tries to build only in the production, but it simulates the build in the actual the staging. After that, it does certain data dog checks. It checks, hey, is my Flask application up and running? Is, uh, am I able to reach data dog? Am I able to reach uh, Splunk? And after all that, there's a clear stage which is encapsulated in the validate. It actually clears the last AMI that it has created. Given it runs every hour, we had about 400 AMIs in a week, and we were getting asked, like, guys, what are you doing? In the end, it destroyed itself at the end of each run, and it runs every hour, as I was saying. So this encapsulates everything, and we are still expanding on this one as we bring in more services into our SDP pipeline. Uh, these are just a couple of the test coverages. Uh, Jenkins has access to our GitHub. Can GitHub be able to trigger a job on the Jenkins master? Can the Spinnaker reach both the Jenkins masters? Packer instances have access to Artifactory. Datadog's uh, agents are configured on the deployed instances. Are they getting configured properly? That's it. My name's Lars. I work on the Spinnaker team at Google. I've been working on this tool called Halyard for a while now. Uh, the goal is to make Spinnaker easier to configure, deploy, and update. Uh, how many of you tried to install Spinnaker before? I, I know Matt asked the question, I didn't turn around. How many people tried to deploy Spinnaker before? How'd it go? How many people did it successfully on the first try? <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a hard one to set up. Uh, we're looking at fixing this. So uh, we, in the past one and a half years, since Spinnaker was open sourced, um, we noticed that uh, there were kind of like two groups of problems that showed up as we saw people try and figure out how to deploy Spinnaker on their own, especially in a production environment. And the first one I think you'll agree with me on is that microservices are hard. They're hard in general. Uh, Spinnaker is made up of nine microservices. Uh, asking any DevOps team to take on their life cycle, uh, that's quite a burden. Um, second thing is Spinnaker, it sounds kind of obvious, but uh, there's a lot of Spinnaker specific knowledge in Spinnaker. There's hundreds of configuration parameters. Uh, some services need special update semantics if you want to roll out new versions. Uh, the tools that Spinnaker was built with might not be familiar to you. And all these things together make Spinnaker, um, or at least pose a pretty big hurdle early on for someone adopting Spinnaker. So uh, looking at the first question, well, Spinnaker is basically made for deploying microservices, so why not take advantage of that? And then for the second problem, a lot of the Spinnaker specific knowledge really can be codified quite well. We can apply validation, we can make sure that However you define your Spinnaker cluster actually is valid and that what you're going to deploy uh, will work before you actually try to do so. Hi, I'm Andrew with, uh, with Armory, and today I'm going to talk uh, for a very short time about Spinnaker on AWS. I realized this was really vague, uh, and I should have renamed it like pain on AWS, because uh, Spinnaker on AWS, unless you're Netflix, is a little painful. So I'll talk about two, two pain points and kind of how to solve them um, and kind of things that you have to do to run it you know, as an enterprise in production. So the, uh, the one that everyone knows and loves is throttling. So everyone's chanting it in the audience as everyone else is talking. Um, Amazon will throttle you on about at least eight APIs. So it'll happen very quickly as soon as you go into production. So there are two ways to mitigate these. Um, one thing you can do is, is try and prevent it in the first place. So it'd be really cool if there was nothing else in your organization that was hitting these APIs. That would be the best, but you know that's not going to happen. So uh, the other thing you can do is you can config configure uh, service limits in CloudDriver. So I think that there is actually a doc for this on Spinnaker I.O., but I couldn't find it very easily. So if you just go to that pull request, 1291, um, there's documentation on how to do this. But uh, it's, it's pretty good, and it'll help you prevent the problem. Uh, the, you know, but that doesn't necessarily solve it completely, because uh, what happens is when you, hit, uh, when you are throttled, your pipeline will fail. So even if you configure your service limits, 
um, you know, and you're trying to be very careful, you're still going to get throttled from time to time if you have other users in your organization um, hitting that API. So <clears throat> I call that like a reactionary response, and we're working on that soon. Or we're working on that, and it should be ready soon. Uh, so that should help uh, everybody with, with that pain. Uh, the other one is uh, IAM permissions. <clears throat> so Cloud Driver is the biggest thing I'll talk about here, but uh, Roscoe does need a certain set of permissions. You can just grab that from the Packer website. They'll tell you this is the minimum set. And then Front 50, uh, you really just need the S3 access. Uh, and you should be good. But a cloud driver, uh, you need a lot of very, if you want to find the minimum set and you don't want to just do power user, well, actually, power user isn't enough. If you don't want to do full administrator, uh, you're going to need to find the, the policy. So I have a generator that you could use, and it will, there's the link right there, and you can generate a policy for every version of cloud driver. So you just point it to a cloud driver, and it'll generate a policy based on you know, whatever is checked out. Uh, <clears throat> Also with that, there are two, I mean, there are several policies needed to actually run CloudDriver. So the account that Spinnaker lives in, uh, we'll call that the managing profile or managing role, it doesn't really need very much. I think it needs uh, two actions allowed to it, which is um, you know, describe VPC and describe region, I think. And then, uh, then but the main thing is any account that you actually want to deploy to, you need to set up a special profile. And that's the one that gets generated by that script. Uh, and that, that we'll call the uh, managed profile or managed rule. And then the last step is you need to set a trust relationship between those two, two roles. Uh, if you do all of that, um, you will have a minimum set of permissions to run uh, Spinnaker on AWS. And that's all. Hey guys, I'm Brandon, uh, I'm from Lookout, and uh, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about how we do database migrations within Spinnaker. So, as we were migrating a bunch of our services from some of our legacy tooling to Spinnaker, we had this problem, like how do we re automate relational database migrations as part of our Spinnaker workflow? So, if you were in the previous meetup here, uh, you'd probably know that we have multiple generations of tooling at Lookout, right? But generally how they executed these migrations in the past, right, is they had either Jenkins or Rundeck actually SSHing into a mutable node that always had existed to actually run migrations from that node. This is a problem in Spinnaker for many reasons, right? First of all, like we're deploying infrastructure, we're not deploying code. And we couldn't SSH, uh, we did not want to try to like manually look up what nodes were being spun up and trying to SSH into one of those nodes uh, to be able to run migrations. One of the other problems that we had uh, is a security issue, right? Like we're kind of like, why are we doing this? Why do we have this SSH access set up from something, some other orchestration tool like Jenkins or Rundeck to be able to run the migrations? So what we ended up doing instead is we actually set up a specific stage in Spinnaker called the executor stage. And in this executor stage, we actually feed an environment variable to the application at, at, in boot time that actually decides whether or not to run migrations. So the cloud detail environment variable defines a server group type. When an instance comes up, its behavior is determined by that cloud detail variable. Deployment moves forward only if the migration logic uh, concluded, su uh, concluded successfully. So like here's like some pseudo bash code that shows kind of what happens, right? Instance comes up, um, if cloud detail is executor, then it runs its migration. So then the question might be, well like how do we know whether or not it, like, it's at the migrations have actually completed? We have a, a service that we wrote called Candle that actually comes up if the migrations are successful and it passes the health check for the ELB and thus the, uh, thus the uh, execution of the pipeline goes forward. If it doesn't succeed and we, it times out, its grace period runs out, we assume that the uh, migrations have failed. Um, also a little thing is that we also have all the logs for these migrations being sent into Splunk for our engineers. So any questions? Do you guys consider using the run job stage uh, available as like launching a Kubernetes container that does this because then uh, just based on the success or failure, you would stop your pipeline? Yeah, we did consider that, but still like we still ended up like having to allow remote access into these nodes, right, to be able to run this. So that's one thing that we did not want to allow. So thanks, guys.
All right, so this concludes our lightning talks. Um, let's uh, look at the questions that came up in the Slido. I've removed some, so what is the website for Slayer? Um, there is no website for Slayer as far as it's a lookout internal server. So can we use Spinnaker to deploy Spinnaker? Yes. C said you use Spinnaker to deploy everything. Uh, so s assuming you do that for uh, Cassandra too, and for do you have any other databases where you can't just take an instance out, um, where you would use Spinnaker too? Like let's say I don't know Redis or something like that. So for um, the thing to realize is that Spinnaker has pipelines, but it also has a very robust API. Um, everything that you do through the UI or you know when you're running by your pipelines is also available to you via the API. And so teams like Cassandra, what they do is they take the Spinnaker API, then write like specific tooling that is better able to look at um, you know state of master slave nodes and that kind of stuff. Um, generally, there's a rolling push strategy that will allow you to do an in-place replace of those nodes. So if you have like Elasticsearch cluster or whatnot, then um, you know always maintain like master node. Then the rolling push strategy is useful for those kind of instances, and uh, you know. Big enough teams will have built either custom tooling or custom pipelines that then do additional checks in terms of their deployment workflow. Um, I don't know if Rob wants to add anything else. I'll, I'll add real quick at Netflix, we use Spinnaker to deploy Jenkins, to deploy Stash, to deploy Hadoop, Presto, Druid, Kafka, probably, what's that? Zookeeper, I mean, we basically all infrastructure is deployed via Spinnaker. You can pretty much deploy anything. Uh, and to Tomas's point, the, it, the API is great for sta stateful services. You know, this is a very, a very uh, in in depth session. If anybody just has any more general questions about Spinnaker, don't be afraid to ask those as well. I'm sure there are people here that just kind of showed up because they were interested in Spinnaker at a high level. So feel free to ask anything. Spinnaker uses OAuth 2.0 for AuthN and SAML for AuthZ. Uh, is not OAuth supposed to be an AuthC framework and SAML an Auth N one? Uh, is there a reason behind this choice? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Travis. I'm the Auth guy. Um, so what's happening behind the scenes is yes, OAuth is uh, technically an authorization framework. Uh, what we're doing is we're asking the user for permission to query either GitHub or Google Groups or whatever your OAuth identi uh, your identity provider is, and we're asking them can we get your email address? And then we go and query them uh, through the OAuth flow asking for your email address. And that is how we, I, that's how we uh, authenticate you as you are who you say you are by your uh, identity provider saying, here's a, you know, this user has successfully logged in and they're giving you permission to go get your email address. Um, so on the other half of that question, is SAML an authorization provider? Uh, I'm sorry, is SAML an authentication provider? Yes. SAML is also a uh, single sign-on authentication, but there are some SSO providers that also provide uh, your group membership. So what Gate does, the, the Gateway API server, uh, when it when you're doing your single service logon, it actually returns all of your group information to say this user is um, you know, a member of groups A, B, and C. And we can use that group information to then enforce your, um, your author uh, to say what applications or what accounts you have access to within Spinnaker, uh, specifically uh, Fiat and the uh, authorization server was mentioned a couple of times tonight. Um, if you guys have any questions about that, come ask me. Other questions? Surprised we haven't seen anything about Spinnaker, how Spinnaker works with Kubernetes or Terraform as, as Armory. We see those questions come up from customers all the time. So if anybody has questions like that, we can take those. Alex, do you want to take the ECS one? Or? Uh, so question to the audience. Is anyone working on ECS support? No. Th does anyone care? Okay. There's a hand in the back. So at, at Lookout, we are fully on AWS, and so we're looking into ECS support, um, just because we don't want to manage Kubernetes. If we were in Google Cloud, probably, um, we'll not need ECS support. So uh, 
we're kind of looking into it. So we may run Kubernetes, we may run on ECS, we don't know yet. Uh, we know that uh, container, containers are our kind of next step after we onboard all of our services onto Spinnaker. And so we'll be looking at that in July, which is coming very soon. The question to Andrew, but it, it's EDDA is EDDA. So EDDA, for the person that asked that question, it's on Netflix is a GitHub. Uh, so there's a Netflix org under GitHub, and EDDA's in there, EDDA. Uh, so if you don't use config management tools, uh, what do some good possible stacks look like? Um, I think Isaac talked about configuration management tools. Do you want to talk about some of the yeah, so if you're not using configuration management, I believe everything on Netflix is Debian packages. Uh, you guys don't use any configuration management, right? No. So uh, through Debian and RPM, you can lay out the disk however you like. Um, any other kind of runtime configuration management that you might need, you can use things like Vault. Uh, that does change, obviously, certain things on disk, like you got to place the secrets eventually on the, on the file system for the application to use it. Uh, but with those two systems alone, you can almost get rid of anything that you're doing with Chef or Ansible and just kind of get rid of that complexity and simplify it and really kind of let your application developers have control of their applications. So, Re oh, uh, there's other tools that I think Netflix is using, like uh, cons um, there you guys are using Arceus, not console, but uh, console's the uh, open source equivalent, I suppose, or uh, the HashiCorp equivalent. Yeah. Um, and so that also allows you to put, you know, uh, properties on the file system at runtime and change things at runtime. Uh, although you got to be careful with that. That's a slippery slope. Uh, I think we've seen people put entire shell scripts and Ruby scripts. I think you guys have seen that in a configuration management system, which is a pretty dangerous thing to do. Uh, but uh, those are other solutions to get rid of the complexity and the, the nightmares of the configuration management tools of the past. Thanks. So some of the slides, um, depending on the author's permission, are going to be available on meetup.com slash Spinnaker. Um, so you can go there and see uh, all of the recent meetups photos and the, also the materials from all the meetups. Um, I'm going to let uh, who came up with the Prometheus. <laughs> no comment. Uh, any thoughts about Edda and using it with Spinnaker? So uh, internally at Netflix, we use Edda. So our thoughts are, it's great. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the Edda that is used open source, or excuse me, the Edda that is used internally is slightly different than the one that's in open source. So uh, I, the last meetup I did kind of put out the challenge if uh, the community could take the open source Edda and kind of bring it more up to speed. There are a couple of, uh, I believe, AWS kind of objects that aren't being uh, cached in Edda in the open source version that we are internally using. But uh, you, Andrew from Armory had said that I guess you're aware of some people having success outside. So that's great. So I think, yeah, the next one maybe for Brendan. How do you deal with a? So I, I guess the best answer is we don't. Um, so like <laughs> mo most of most of uh, our ORMs that we use, like if if the, if the migration does not complete, it will automatically roll it back anyways. Uh, and then uh, from that that point forward, so say I'm an engineer, migration does not succeed, right? It fails. It is kind of automatically rolled back by the ORM. And then their only really thing is to do another release, either drop the migration, right? And 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 move forward with another release without the migration or to uh, uh, fix it, right? Figure out why it didn't complete, so. Is there any data on average organization size using Spinnaker, also team size managing it? That's a good question. I, I can speak of uh, Lookout. Um, we have about a team of six people full-time uh, implementing Spinnaker, not really managing it, but it's a, it's been about a six month journey to convert four or five different uh, deployment methodologies at Lookout uh, to Spinnaker. And so today, or at the end of this month, we will have a GA quality Spinnaker deployment at Lookout uh, where we'll be able to onboard 80% uh, of our services. And Ben, do you want to uh, 
talk about some of the companies we surveyed that were using Spinnaker? I was just going to say that um, this is a really good question. We had one internal team that we spoke to maybe six months ago, maybe a little more, um, that was interested. I think they're running on GKE maybe. Had asked us about running Spinnaker, and we sort of had a well, like an hour-long conversation and sussed out sort of their footprint and kind of came to the determination that um, probably not big enough to warrant taking on the burden of running Spinnaker themselves. They have to run it themselves, so we weren't going to do it. Um, so we sort of talked them out of it. And now with Halyard, well, I mean, they don't pay us any extra. You know. <laughs> but now with Halyard, we really do think like the risk of taking on the, the burden of running Spinnaker is greatly reduced. And we're, we're speaking to that team again, and they're likely going to now run Spinnaker, but manage it with the, the new set of tools. So um, that, that, that sort of determination looks quite a bit different than it did pre-Halyard, which is why we did Halyard. So. Yeah, uh, this is Ben from Armory. Uh, we recently surveyed about eight companies that are running Spinnaker in production, and the average size of the, the engineering team managing it is eight, eight full-time engineers. In terms of the other question, is there any data on average organization size? Um, I don't have any, but I would say that the, uh, the pain point, I guess the pain around deployments increases with the size of the organization, because even more engineering teams who are deploying. So at, at Lookout, we have 100 plus engineers, and so we have a team of six who's been working full-time for the last six months bringing Spinnaker in. And so it, it's everything, uh, people, process, and technology, so it's not just let's install Spinnaker and let it, uh, let all the developers at Lookout use it. There's a lot of hand-holding. We had five or six different mid deployment methodologies, so there's a lot of transition, a lot of education, documentation, hand-holding, you know, getting people bought in into the continuous delivery, I think that was probably the most challenging thing. Like one other data point, we helped um, Waze um, get up and running and kind of just answer all their like questions that the ops team there can't answer themselves for the developers. And I think they had, they had two or three people basically responsible for like setting up and feeding Spinnaker over time, along with whatever else they were already doing. Um, but they did have our team like on direct line to help them with questions and things. And their deployment is kind of complex because it's like spread across internal infrastructure and some cloud stuff. The thing like Andy said about like Netflix not being very strict in terms of like users and permissions, like we don't have that. So their thing was really complex and it's split across a couple of different clouds. So um, that took some doing. And they're deploying to both um, GCP and AWS. But even so, it's just a couple of few guys, and that's pre-Halyard, so not too bad. Any other questions? I think it's just kind of a follow-up, which is, what's the smallest size number of services you'd start looking at Spinnaker for, of managing? Ben, do you have any stats, or like the smallest organization? I think at Lookout, we have 80 plus services, so I don't I, probably shouldn't be. We talked to a lot of companies that are evaluating Spinnaker, and I would say, I mean, this is a very rough estimate, but 100 engineers-ish, 100 services maybe, is the tipping point where something like Spinnaker really makes sense. To give you some perspective, uh, my startup is three months old, uh, so we got to start everything from scratch, which is nice, um, and I d I'm the only DevOps person. I've been doing ops and IT for 20 years. I'm the only DevOps person, and my goal is to not go super complex because all the developers will look at me <laughs> like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, so uh, I deployed Spinnaker on my own, and I support it on my own. Um, and we have, uh, we're up to eight or nine applications in it, um, all with their own unique sets of stages and pipelines. Um, so awesome. and we're, only, we're, only, we're only eight people, and yeah, I'm the only DevOps person, so. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Hopefully uh, this was a lot of good content for you and we hope to have more of these meetups. Thanks to all the speakers.